If I were to stand here and do what I will do and say to you, the Bible is right, what would cross your mind? Words of eagles of thought or signs of ideas, that conveys a thought, it conveys an idea. The Bible is right. Well, let's just say, how would the most of this area, let's not leave Harris Montgomery County area, Houston area, what do you think most people would say to that? Would they say, true or false? The Bible is right. Or do you say, what do you mean by Bible? You might even say, what do you mean by right? They might even want to know, True or false, what do you mean when you say the Bible is right? You never know what goes on in people's minds. And the further they get away from the influence of God through the Word of God and their minds being trained to think, then you just simply have to ask more questions to find out what is going on in their mind. But whatever is going on in their mind, it doesn't change the truth of the statement, the Bible is right. Because by the Bible, of course, I mean those 66 books, Old and New Testament, that is commonly called the Bible. And when I say is, that's its state of being. And when I say right, I don't mean turning to the right hand or the left hand. I mean correct. Well, correct for what? Well, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 makes that clear. All Scripture, well, I now use the word Scripture in the place of Bible. So I mean by Bible, Scripture, and all the Bible or all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now I've got to explain inspiration. And it is simply God by the Holy Spirit revealing His mind to man through human beings. And to keep their fallible human nature from messing it up, then... I have to indicate that he overruled their ability to make mistakes and guaranteed that it would be recorded infallibly. And so on you go, just by breaking these things down. But in the church, if you've lived a long time in the church and heard proper teaching and been familiar with your own personal study, a lot of these things, well, everybody knows it, don't they? They all understand it. We don't have to define anything. We just use this terminology. But that's really not the case, never has been, but especially the last few years now and no doubt into the future. We need to explain to people what we're talking about, even in a simple thing like the Bible is right, before they can ever answer true or false. Because they may not believe that there is a true or a false. They may think, of gray areas in between. I remember one time Brother Warren used the illustration of some philosophy teacher or something he had, and they were talking about a thing is or it is not. That means they respect the law of the excluded middle. There's no middle ground. It is or it is not. You're human or you're not. Well, there's oil either directly beneath my feet or there's not. And he said, oh, okay. He said, Warren? He said, uh, is a fog rain? Is a misty day rain? Is a cloud rain? We see, then that comes back down to the definition. So it all comes down to what do I mean by the use of this word? If I've been trained in a society, and somebody calls you ugly, they mean what we mean by beautiful. So if I say, Brett, you're very ugly. Now you know that in my society and culture and language, that means you're very beautiful. You can believe that if you want to. So you... <laughs> but when you... When you take wor words, mean something. Words mean something. And thus we're concerned about the translation of the original Greek inspired by the Holy Spirit, or at least the men that used it were inspired, that it gets into English what was said in the Greek or the Hebrew for the Old Testament. Or if you're talking 
to people and they're translating for you now. Uh, you want to make sure they have such a command of your language and the target language into which they're translating it that they're going to say the language as close as you can to what you said in the language, your own tongue. So it, little things do make a difference. And Ken always talks about how sometimes I use farm terminology. And so many of the people nowadays, if you say, I would, young man, straighten up or I'll tear your britches up like a sow's bed. They have no idea what a sow is, uh, why you would use that terminology. Or your britches won't hold shucks. They don't know what shucks are. And they probably don't know what britches are. All that kind of thing has to do with getting over to people what you want them to understand. The Bible's right. And if you can say that in how many languages there are existing, it's still right. The Bible's correct. It is the standard for determining right and wrong in all things moral and spiritual. The standard. But now, can all men understand the Bible? A lot of people, even those who claim to believe it, some of them say that, no, no, you can't do it. Yet when I read such a statement as John 12, 48, we all are familiar with that, John 12, 48, Jesus said, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. Now, if you can't understand the Bible, that doesn't make sense. That whole passage has to do with understanding God's will for your life. Now the question really is, do all men, do all men understand the Bible? Some do, and some do not. Because there's a difference between the words can and do. You're able to, but the way that God made you, normally speaking, to understand His revelation that He put in words on your own level of understanding. But do we? Do we understand it? The Bible presupposes that we do because here it is delivered from God infallibly to us in words that are addressed to us as He created us to understand. Yet the Bible's full of material that says you don't understand. Your eyes you have closed. Your ears you have stopped. So I begin to understand no matter how well God put His Word on this earth so I could understand His will for my life here, that doesn't mean I will. Because that involves me using my faculties in the proper way to be able to understand. Jesus said one time, take heed what you hear. Then He said another time, take heed how you hear it. And he was instructing us the disposition of heart that we ought to have when we approach to study the Bible. So much for that, there are reasons as to why some understand and some don't. In uh, Matthew's account of the soils, if you want to call it that, which he likened to hearts, Matthew 13, we read in verse 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Heart meaning the inward man, the place of your mind, and intellect, and rational powers. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. Now remember the seed is the word of God. So the word is the same in every case. And the word was delivered to man for man's own benefit, which meant he had to understand it. In fact, you'll remember when the, Philip was sent by the Spirit to the Ethiopian eunuch. His question was, Understandest thou what thou readest? I've tried that several times with a number of people. See them read their Bible. I remember I did that Singapore one time in McDonald's. And the fellow was over here, didn't know where he was. Sitting over there, he had his Bible open. He was reading it, looked rather intent. 
I just walked up to him and said, do you understand what you're reading? He looked so perplexed. I never did get an answer. Well, why was he reading it? I suppose he's trying to get understanding. But I think that's a good approach to people. Sure breaks the ice. So there are two hearts that are mentioned in this passage. Verse 23, But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also bears fruit and brings forth some in hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Two hearts are mentioned then in this passage. The cause of the difference is given then in Luke's account of this same parable and that's Luke 8 15 and this is something you can do for yourself I think all of us can be objective enough to know do I have an honest and good heart and that in the good ground these are they are such as in an honest and good heart having the word hold it fast and bring forth fruit with patience now, I want to pause here and say this before we say anything else. You realize no matter how long you've been a faithful Christian or how brief a time it's been, these principles are always necessary. They're always. The basic difference between understanding and not understanding in this particular teaching is are you honest with yourself and with what you've read? Do you have a disposition of your mind, your heart, that you will receive the truth no matter what it demands in your life. No matter what kind of corrections it's going to demand out of you. Are you willing to do it? And I hate to say it, but most of the people in the world are not. They have preconceived notions. You don't even know for sure what are they looking for in a religion. Are they looking for something that will condone their actions, period, so they don't expect that to change anything? Uh, what are they going to do? If they admit this is the only way to salvation and I'm going to die sometime, are they going to admit there's a day of judgment and that they must give account to the Lord who created them for the way they lived here? What's going to be the standard whereby we're judged? Maybe that they're not thinking along those lines much, and I think that's where a lot of folks are nowadays. They're too caught up in the material and the day-by-day -day life to give the proper thought if any thought, to these things. And to themselves. Have you ever asked yourself the question, am I an honest person? Am I a good person? Then you have to ask the question, what do you mean by good? What do you mean by honest? So it even demands that we get a proper definition of those things. Can I handle reality for what it is? A lot of folks can't. They just can't. And that's part of being honest and good, handling reality. This is the way that it is. I think one of the hardest things we face is accepting things we can't change. Think about it for a minute. I said it this morning. We can all stand some pretty rough stuff for a short period. But when it sinks in on us, this is the way it's going to be, as we usually say, from here on out, <laughs> however out is. That gets kind of tough. I said to the doctor the other day, I said, you know the problem with getting old is that when you're a young person, you tend to think, well, I'll get over this and I'll get back to where I was. And old folks have to come to grips with the fact you ain't getting over this and you're not going back to where you were. You might live a viable life until you fade on out or go out rather suddenly, but you're not going to go back with my age. At 75, I am not going to back and be 40. I don't think I want to, but nevertheless, I'm not. I'm not going back to be 25. Now, here's the first thing you got to do about that. Stop thinking you are. Now, that's hard to do. But you got to accept the reality of where you are, not where you were. You left that behind you. And that's true spiritually. Remember Paul talking about the outward man is what? Well, that's decaying day by day. It's going down. What is that about the inward man? It's renewed day by day. There's a way that happens. My mind is on the truth, the application of it to my life. I heard Brother B.C., the late Brother B.C. Goodpasture, preach his final sermon. He was in his early 80s. 
She had freed Hardman. And he made a point. He said, you know, as I stand here without looking at myself and thinking about how chronologically old I am, well, I, I, I think it's like I always thought. I mean, I don't feel any age in my thinking. I don't. But then when I look in the mirror, I don't look like I did 50 years ago. And I have to accept the reality of it. A month later, he was dead. Got out of his car, had a massive stroke, dropped dead in the driveway. Honesty of heart of the inward man, of accepting reality and living with it. The only book in this world is going to help you do that in every phase of your life is the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's a book for me. It's the only one. It takes living seed and fertile soil to produce a plant. And similarly, a living word and an honest and good heart are essential to making a Christian. You can, have the, you can hear the best preacher and his knowledge of the Bible and ability to instruct there is. And you can hear him all day long every day. You can read the best books by the most knowledgeable people of the Bible in every phase of Christian living. But if you don't have an honest and good heart and you don't intend to keep it, it's not going to do you any good. So if the needs... If the, if the need to be saved is there, then there's an appropriate path one must take inwardly. The seed doesn't germinate as in a bean or a pea or corn. Then that seed is either uh, dead or the soil is barren, one or the other. It can't, doesn't have the wherewithal to make things sprout. So when the preaching of God's word does not produce a Christian in those who hear it and understand it, the fault cannot be the word of God. 1 Peter 1 verse 23, Peter said to Christians, referring to the fact that they were Christians and how and when they became Christians, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So when the truth in its purity and right, right division of it is preached and people listen and understand it and they don't respond to the gospel and obedience to it, fault's not in the word. The fault is in the soil it's been sown in. The basic cause must be then the lack of an honest and good heart. Some simply don't understand Jesus' preaching because, as it was said in Matthew 13, 13 through 15, by Jesus quoting the Old Testament, their heart has waxed gross. We're in the same chapter we started with a moment ago, verses 13 through 15. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see not, and hearing they do hear not, they, and neither do they understand. Now, this is one of those places where I said the parables were written to people for their understanding, but to certain people it was written so they wouldn't understand. It all depended upon the attitude they had toward the message. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. Why? Where's the problem? Soil. Listen. For well, this people's heart is waxed gross, so their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they've closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Then he pronounces a blessing on the disciples' eyes because they do hear and understand and apply by the truth. So when it's all said and done, you could have the best, Teachers of the Bible, you could read your Bible every day, but if you're not going to make the adjustments the Bible demands to be converted, forget it. You cannot go to heaven. People can, but do not understand the Bible for a very simple reason, another reason. They don't want to. When you've got a person who doesn't want to do something, you're not going to get much done. If anything, 
None of it done right. They have closed their eyes. They don't strive to understand God's Word because they don't seek to obey His will. But every honest and good heart will always seek to obey God's will and strive to understand God's Word. I mentioned this, I think, last week. John chapter 7, verse 17, where our Lord said, If any man willeth to do his will, he shall know of the teaching. Just the way we're put together and the way God meant for the Word of God to be understood. I believe that God in His providence leads the honest and good heart to the Word, to the truth, to the gospel. That doesn't mean it's going to save the people. The senseless heart that does not will to glorify God and humble obedience to His will will gradually, and I don't know how gradually that might be, but gradually... It'll lose whatever knowledge of God it had to begin with. Romans 1.21 starts out with all men knowing God existed. But they didn't desire to retain God their knowledge. And the Bible says God gave them up. And thus they lost what knowledge of God they had because there was not a desire to keep doing God's will. There was not a desire to pursue it. And they lost what they had. Because that knowing God... They glorified Him not as God, neither gave thanks, but became vain in their reasonings. That's pointless in their reasonings. And their senseless heart was darkened. Then watch. Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles, the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and of strong, not of strong meat. Difficult things, in other words. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe, a strong meat belongeth unto them that are full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and and evil. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. We've had occasion recently to refer to that verse several times. But do you see what he's saying? You people heard the gospel and from the heart you obeyed the gospel. You are members of the church. You are Christians. What's wrong with you? You haven't continued. And you've lost what you even learned. It's just the way we're put together. Thus Peter would say this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in which birth I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. It has to be that way. It's the way one cultivates the truth and keeps it sharp in his or her mind. So for want of the will to glorify and obey God, these people's mental power, those in Hebrews, these people's mental power of discernment became pointless in its reasonings. And their perhaps once sensitive heart now turned senseless, was darkened. Brethren, we, you don't have the church falling away except that it had something at one time. It possessed it. It was good. But they left it. They fell away. That's apostasy. I knew it. It's truth. I lived it. But then I left it. And that's what we have transpiring in the people to whom the Hebrews epistle was written. And you have a lot of folks like that, of course, we touched upon before they ever become Christians. You never get to first base with them. So people get this sense, this heart developed, and their views are distorted. Even in commonly understood things, they've distorted it. Because their enlightened heart did not direct their lives toward God. It became a slave of their vile passions as it happened in the Gentiles' departure from God, Romans 1.28. And they degenerated into a reprobate mind. You think about this nation, it's moving further and further. Every time it steps away a little further from the static standard of divine objective truth, it allows for more to enter in. 
it builds. People get deceived into believing error when they receive not the love of the truth. Paul wrote that. We'll touch on it some more in the class on Sunday morning. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 11. It talks about people falling away from the faith. How does it happen? How, does this, how, how do I fall away from the truth I once loved and cherished? So happy to hear it. I didn't know it, and I'm glad I learned it. I'm saved from my sins. I was baptized into Christ. Now, that, that's changed now. What happened? And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's a powerful verse. That says so much to us about ourselves. It ought to make us all fear. Notice the devil approaches us through lies. A lie is contrary to the truth, to reality. The reality we have on spiritual matters is the reality of God's Word that He gave to guide us. And it will judge us someday. And in this particular case, writing to Christians, he was talking about people falling away from the truth. Well, how did it happen? Deceivableness of unrighteousness. Righteousness is God's will. Unrighteousness is that which is not God's will. And they're the ones that are perishing spiritually. They are not going to heaven. Why do they get in this shape? They did not receive the love of the truth. I would say if there's anything I can emphasize to me, to anybody in my family, to anybody in this room, to anybody anywhere, love the truth. Love the truth more than you love your necessary food or the next breath you take. Love the truth. Because if you don't love that, you will not go to heaven. You'll not study your Bible. You'll not be what the Bible says you must be to be saved. And then here's what happens. This is that falling away process. God sends you a strong delusion. And people get the idea, well, you mean God knows? And He's just going to give me this false view? No, it doesn't mean that. It means when you have fallen out of love with the truth God did, did give you, and you turn from it, you know you're not turning to the truth. You're turning to a lie. People ought to think about that when they leave something. You don't leave something except you go somewhere else. And if you leave Jesus, if you leave the Bible, if you leave the gospel, you're going somewhere else. Now you're going to find the truth there? No. It's only going to be a lie. Because in effect, your dishonest and bad heart is leaving you to reject the truth you've already been given and maybe obeyed. And now you don't want that. Reality is not what you want. But truth is reality. But I don't want that. Notice how he talks about the delusion. And for this God, cause, God shall send them a delusion. Leave the truth, and wherever you go is a delusion. It's not reality. Not concerning what I must do to be saved from sin and live a godly life. And so, God's allowing you to do what you want to do. You don't want the truth or the reality of what you need concerning salvation then God will allow you to go where you want to go. And guess what? You'll believe a lie and be damned. What is hell? Well, you said it's the place all wicked people go at the end of time in this world and all things material are over and done with. And they stood before God in judgment and they've been condemned to hell. They go there and that's where they are from now on and from then on. And we can't fathom it anymore. We can fathom the glories, majesty, and the goodness of heaven. But that's where we're going to be. But all hell is is absence of God. Now, why would anybody want to be where God isn't? Because they proved all their life here they didn't want to do God's will. They would not accept the reality the truth of God reveals. They did everything they could to set it aside to do as they please. And even members of the church would do the same thing. Well, don't be so hard on members of the church. Well, most of the New Testament's written to members of the church to keep them on straight and narrow. 
So what's that saying? If I don't want the reality of God's truth, then God will say, go get what you want. And if you don't learn the difference before you die, then you'll be in a place where I don't even have any influence whatsoever. You didn't want that, so there I am. You got what you wanted. And so hell's a prepared place for prepared people, just like heaven's a prepared place for prepared people. It's prepared for the people that don't love God, don't care for God, don't seek to do God's will here. Find every way in the world to do what they want to do, no matter what it does, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. What did they do? They had pleasure in violating God's will. People shy away from the light. They don't study their Bible like they ought to. We beg and plead that we study the Bible. They won't. They won't listen to God's Word preached with honest and good hearts. They absent themselves from worship periods and Bible teaching. You beg and plead and do everything else. They, they're going to do as they please. They love darkness. They hate the light. Jesus said in John three nineteen through 20, And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. You know, I was saying, I don't like to be told I'm wrong. Well, if you're wrong, you want me to told you're right? I don't know how a person becomes a Christian as the Bible defines Christian in true conversion if they hadn't come to grips with the fact I'm wrong. When you decide to obey the gospel, were you saying, I'm right, I'm right? Well, why didn't you obey the gospel? You're baptized for the remission of sins. Before that, you repented of your sins, Acts 17 and 30. Well, that's being not right. <laughs> that's being not right. You want to be right. What is wrong with wanting to be right with God? We're almost made to feel guilty today to say, I want to be right. I don't want to be wrong. Somebody else over there saying, well, there's no right and wrong. Just whatever strikes your fancy. But the Bible says there is a right and there is a wrong. In Proverbs 4.18, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. There are many factors that contribute to ignorance, misunderstanding, and the rejection of God's Word. I think I have to conclude from my study of the Bible that the basic cause is just simply a heart wax gross or the lack of an honest and good heart. You can teach somebody all day long who has that state of mind, it won't do any good. Jesus had that in mind when he says, when he talked about casting your pearls before swine. Why? Because they don't appreciate pearls. If you've got, if you've got some expensive ring, a diamond, go a hog pen, pitch it over and see how much they appreciate it. They don't. And he said, not only will they not appreciate it, they will rend you as they trample that under their feet. Well, folks, what is the message? Why did he write that? What am I to get from that? There are people like that. That when you teach them, no matter how well you teach them the truth, they don't appreciate it. They don't love it. And what will they do? They won't realize the value of it. In fact, they will attack you. The honest and good heart will understand the Bible, for it will drive one to seek and to find God's will. But if our heart is waxed gross, we will not understand the Bible. As he says, our senseless heart will be darkened and we'll be deceived. We'll go into error and compound that error. Wherefore, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4, 23. There's a lot in that verse. Let's keep our heart honest. Let's keep our hearts good, earnestly seeking to obey God's will. And with a fervency and a passion for loving God's truth and what that drives us to do in the pursuit of knowing it and studying it. Only thus can we keep it sensitive to perceive God's truth and sharp to discern God's will in every situation and keen to understand God's work. I don't know how more basic a thing can be than, than this sermon. I do this every now and then. 
and I did it today. I picked this old outline out and I've preached it from the time I was in my 20s. And I don't know when I did this, but I wrote down on the side of it at the top, it's all in longhand, a Bible telecast. Sometime I was on television and I presented this material. Somewhere back in the days that I'll never see again. <laughs> but you know, if somebody preached that same message, whether you use my outline or not, it would make a difference. A hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, it will be just as true then as it is now or when I first preached it, and just as true as the Word of God's true. Because all I did was just pick the verses out that dealt with the subject in the proper context and make an arrangement of it. That's what you do when you make a sermon out. <laughs> So what is my status heart-wise toward God's Word? There are people here now that need to obey the gospel. I don't know whether you will or you won't. But I know what will keep you from it. And I know what will cause you to do it. It'll be your heart. Your disposition of mind. Your love or lack of love for the truth. Because I don't think anybody that's listening to preaching around here can say it's been too difficult to understand what one must do to be saved from your sins be faithful go to heaven and we would do well to ask as we close the lesson if I haven't believed in Christ repented of my sins confessed my faith in Christ and been baptized for the remission of our sins with the resolve to be faithful to him until I die however long a short time period that is what is the status of my heart what is there that's keeping me from acting upon what I confess is the truth that God's given me to lead me from earth to heaven. If you're subject to the good gospel invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.